Hi everyone, my name is Tymon Smektawa and I'm the lead game designer of Dying Light 2. Welcome to our AMA. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for all of the questions you have sent us. It was more than 9,000 questions, so it's a lot. We have chosen the ones that were appearing most frequently. So first, the number one question. How big is the map of Dying Light 2? So this is something we have said before. It's about double the size of all of the maps from Dying Light 1 combined. If you have played the first game, I think it will be easy for you to imagine how big the map will be. You, will, you just take the slums, you take the old town, you combine them and you double the number. And that's roughly the size of the game space in Dying Light 2. If you want to know the number, it's more than six square kilometers big, almost seven square kilometers. But that's a simple answer which doesn't take into account the verticality of the world. So just imagine there are hundreds of buildings and each one of them has at least a couple of floors. There are even skyscrapers, there are roofs, bridges, all of that stuff. So you can imagine how big the actual space you'll be playing in is. Oh, that's a good one. What is that zombie with branches on its back? Volatiles already gave me mini heart attacks. I'm worried I will lose my life now. I'm worried as well because the volatiles in Dying Light 2 are even more scary. So uh, fingers crossed for you. And answering your question, the guy with the branches, he's actually a new type of infected in our game. And uh, I don't want to spoil too much because we are preparing a huge drop of information about our infected that's coming. But what I can tell you right now is that he's definitely not a nice guy and he will also give you quite a lot of those mini heart attacks. The interesting thing about this guy is that you can actually make him happen, make him appear in your game. So the fact that he appears in your world is just one of the consequences that you can have when you make specific decisions. So if he really is that scary for you, just try to make good decisions and maybe he will not haunt your dreams. going to be zombies at night or will we see some wandering around on rooftops? That's a very good question because it touches on the most important rule of the world of Dying Light 2 which is the day is for humans but the night and the night is for the infected. What that means is that during the day the infected hide inside buildings, inside dark places where they can avoid sun rays or UV lights. So yes, there are less of them on the streets during the day, uh, but it doesn't mean you won't encounter them. There are still some, some, some of them are weakened, some of them are slower, but they still pose a threat. Another threat that you have to face during the day is of course bandits and other humans, but that's uh, a different type of story, another story. One more thing that you can do is you can actually draw the infected from their hiding places. For example, if you make a lot of noise, so then they run, uh, away, run from, run from uh, their hiding places and they try to attack you, they try to fight with you or some other NPCs, some other humans uh, around. Of course, it lasts only for a short amount of time because they are afraid of, of, of the sun rays, so then they go back, go back, but yes, you will still be able to encounter them during the day. Another interesting thing you asked about is the rooftops. And it's interesting because it touches on the, another very important concept of Dying Light 2, which is that the rooftops are being used by, by the people that live in the city to rebuild the civilization. So while you will be exploring, actually you will see a lot of um, safe houses, uh, um, uh, farm fields and additional stuff like that on the rooftops. So they need to be safe. So there aren't that many biters, virals or other infected on the rooftops during the day. But of course, when the night comes, it's a completely different type of story because the day is for humans, but the night is for the infected. Okay, but what about the guns? Yes, guns. Another question that came up very often. So this is something we have also been telling you guys already. So uh, there are no firearms in the world of Dying Light 2, 
Why? Because it's a world where the civilization is destroyed, is gone. So actually no one is able to create like professional firearms. There will be ranged weapons, bows and something extra, which, free, which fit more the modern Dark Ages idea, the modern Dark Ages concept. Having said that, there is actually one option you can choose to use something similar to a firearm and this is a handmade shotgun. A very nice tool we have introduced for you to create, craft with the stuff you, have found, you, you can find during exploration. When you craft it, when you create it, you can start using it using your left hand. So you can have a shotgun in your left hand and a machete or a sword or a hammer in your second one. And it really allows you to combine those two tools in combat encounters, a, a very powerful combination. But the thing is that the shotgun, because it's handmade, it doesn't last long. So it can get destroyed very easily. So it's up to you when you decide to use that powerful piece of, of, of weapon. Okay, so uh, is the grappling hook still in the game or as it was in the extended gameplay trailer? If yes, how does it work? So of course it is still in the game and uh, we have really put a lot of effort into making it a completely new tool, a tool that's better than the one that you got used to in Dying Light 1. So I think the most important thing for us was to make the grappling hook as real, as natural, as physical as possible. So um, it works differently now. You will not be able to fly through the whole map in one minute, as in the first game. Uh, as I said, it's way, way more physical and way, way more realistic. So if you need something to, 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 to help you imagine this is that in the first game with the grappling hook you could almost feel like a Spider-Man. In this game, in the second game, you feel more like a Tarzan. Uh, so uh, swinging on, on ropes and, 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 and everything. So of course you could say, oh, I prefer to be a Spider-Man than a Tarzan. Good for you, but wait till you see the thing in action. It's really, really really immersive and uh, it has a lot of uses not only in traversal not only in parkour but also in combat so trust us we know what you what we're doing and uh, you will enjoy the new grappling hook a lot mm. oh this one is very important and very interesting the question is will there be cars vehicles in the main game area so the answer is you will be driving inside a vehicle in one specific mission, the one we have shown to you at, uh, in our last demo. Uh, we didn't want to spend more time on it because we feel all of our other traversal methods are way, way more interesting. So of course you have parkour uh, and with our natural movement system and the improvements we have made uh, in the second game, you can really travel through the city uh, with great ease, overcoming any obstacles, doing those huge jumps. So it's really, really very exciting. And on top of that, we also add the grappling hook, the paraglider, and some additional stuff we'll be talking about in the future. So we wanted to stick to that because this is the DNA of Dying Light. This is what makes our game unique. Okay, so this one is actually another question that appeared very, very frequently. So the question is, how many choices do you have that actually change the world and the story? Uh, so I don't want to give you an exact number, but I want to explain to you uh, how the whole system works. So in Dying Light 2, you make choices, you make decisions on three different levels. So the first one, the, as you can say, the, the, the upper one, the top one, uh, is a number of main story choices, a few of them, which really change how the story flows and what kind of ending you will get when you finish the whole experience. Then the second level is uh, choices and decisions you make inside side quests or even main quests that mostly have consequences that are contained within those quests, within those missions, or quite often they also influence the world. An example of this is uh, in one of the quests, you can, for example, save an opera singer. If you do that, if you make a correct choice, then she appears in one of the hubs, in one of the safe zones in the game and starts singing 
Some people like it, some people don't. Some people will tell you it was a stupid thing to do, but it's all up to you. And this is an example of one of those little details that you can actually change in your world. And the third level is the so-called city alignment system. And this is a system where based on your choices, one of the factions takes control over specific areas of the city. So when they do that, of course, they install their forces, they install a lot of different things that belong to that faction. And some of the things are the things that you can use in gameplay. So for example, if you play with the peacekeepers, they start installing um, so-called combat helpers, combat traps that you can use while fighting with bandits or infected or whatever. If you side with survivors and you give parts of the city to survivors, they start installing things like zip lines and uh, trampolines and other stuff that makes the traversal easier. So depending on your choices, you can also shape the gameplay space, the gameplay environment and have a different uh, experience depending on what you do. The next one is, how diverse are regions in Dying Light 2? Will we see fields and plains, suburbs or any additional locations? So as you know, the game takes place inside a city and it's a huge city, so as all of the huge cities out there in the world, it's actually quite diverse. You can say that there are two main regions in the city, which is an area which is a little bit close to Old Town and another one which is more like a downtown with huge skyscrapers and all of that stuff. Within those regions, there are seven zones where you can make decisions and assign those zones to different factions. So, for example, if you side with survivors, you will start seeing things like fields or bakeries or uh, other small communities that are building, rebuilding themselves around various city locations. And if you side with peacekeepers, you will start seeing more of our military stuff like outposts, barricades, things like that. So depending on your choices and how you assign each of the zones, you can end up with a completely different looking type of city. Mm -hmm. 